I'll do a little quick intro, okay. introduce you, and then we're literally just gonna All right. just gonna go back. I like forth. not live, so you know you can just edit the hell out of it. Oh yeah, this, yeah, we're yeah. Trust me, I say super shit all the time. So, <laughs> um. hey hey. What's up? Welcome. How's it going? Hey. Ah, there we go. Just no more. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Chapel Chats. Uh, this is one of our early episodes, and super excited today because uh, for the first time we have a real dignitary in the backyard. We have Jonathan Milton, who is a Raleigh City Council member. Thank you for coming by. Thank you. Yeah. I like Chapel Chats. So Chapel okay. Chats. Yes. Well, I mean, you're you're a big deal. So to have you here. To, to land a guest like this, That's I mean, right. especially this early, we're pretty excited about it, and uh, I, I'm sure you didn't sleep last night. Well, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> and before I forget, I told you I need to say this, and I'm going right. to say it. Um, you know, everything we talk about, any opinions I express are mine, and not necessarily the opinions of the city of Raleigh. So yes. I want to make sure to go ahead and get that out. Yes. Jonathan's also an attorney, so he's going to make sure to get things yes. like that out. <laughs> yes. No. Get Thank it you. Get it yeah, this is not. These are not on behalf of the city of Raleigh. Also, a couple things we want to uh, uh, to get out there as well, just from a housekeeping perspective. Uh, we're recording these. These are not live, uh, and so we're recording them at a time where it's okay to be at a safe distance uh, per our government and health officials in someone's backyard. We're at least six feet apart, maybe a little bit more. Ian's way over there behind the camera. We've wiped everything down. We've got hand sanitizer and wipes on on hand. If we're told in the future that it's not cool to do this, we won't do it, uh, but these are recorded and as of today uh, we can do these and we are lucky enough to have uh, Jonathan by. How has your life been different uh, just over the past few days because everything has changed so quickly? Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned that I'm a lawyer. Um, yep. You know, I have a law practice. I'm a partner there with a handful of the partners and attorneys and we have really taken steps to um, ensure our safety and the safety of our clients and our staff. So we're all working remotely mm -hmm. the best that we can. So that means a lot of Zoom meetings and um, accessing client files remotely. Uh, my partner lives in Manhattan, mm -hmm. um, but he is here now for the near foreseeable future, certainly until um, it's safe to go back to Manhattan. He's when did he make remotely. that choice to come down? A couple of days ago, right when things oh, wow. were starting to turn. Um, I think we sort of saw things changed, as you know, so quickly. Yeah. And when things were starting to, um, I guess, domino over with, uh, you know, folks closing offices and um, restaurants and bars being closed. I know in New York they were preparing to get hit particularly hard because they're so dense. The population right. is so dense there. He just felt like it was the right time to get out. So. Was there any, and just in that last couple of, of uh, you, you, like you said, so much really between maybe Wednesday of last week and it's changed so quickly, yeah. was there any concern that maybe he wouldn't be able to, uh, to get out of there? Or, or what, was that, what was that conversation like? Was it just like, get down here? Or, or how did that go? Um, I was concerned. I yeah. tend to be more of the um, paranoid, not paranoid, <laughs> but uh, anxious, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, plan two steps, three steps ahead type person. I right. like that in everything. Yeah. And so I was you know, messaging him saying, you should go ahead, uh, change your flight. He was planning to come down um, a Friday. He ended up coming Sunday before. Mm -hmm. So like a whole, you know, five days early. Um, because I think I annoyed him enough. <laughs> and also things were changing so quickly. I do think he started to get a little concerned. Yeah. As he said, when all the head honchos in New York started saying, you know, hunker down, stay inside. He's like, I, I better, I better go ahead and get out of there. Yeah. And so he's here for the foreseeable future. He's here for the foreseeable future. Yes. And you're working from home. Working from home and, um, you know, managing council stuff from home. Mm -hmm. How's that going? Because uh, tell me what the city council has done. And again, you're not speaking on behalf of the council, yeah. but as a member of the council, yes. what has the city council done just in the last few days that are that is really different from yeah. how we're used to the city being run? Well, we had one meeting. Um, we had a meeting and that was we were actually at the table um, getting an update on you know, coronavirus and news came in at that meeting a couple weeks ago that the first case in Wake County or North Carolina had mm -hmm. been confirmed. And then our next scheduled meeting was I think only a week after, maybe two weeks after, and things had changed so much. And so at, at our most recent meeting, we um, went ahead and suspended all meetings through mid-April. We told our boards and commissions, you know, your meetings should be suspended. We told them it's okay, suspend those. Uh, planning commission, oh, basically every, the business of the city as far as public meetings goes, we suspended those for a month. So um, 
and we've really just been working closely with the city manager's office on making sure that the actual business of the city can continue even though the public meetings are not. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes down at you know, the municipal building, the city manager runs the city with the staff right. there. And so doing what they can to keep things moving forward but also keeping staff safe. So it's just been a crazy, rapidly evolving time um, yeah. and we're just you know, rolling with it, I suppose kind of like everybody is, I guess, yeah. you're a relatively, a lot of the council members are relatively yes. new to council, you included. Yeah. Uh, you've only been on the job for a few months now. Uh, and again, you made the good point that in the city of Raleigh, it's, 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 really, it's really city manager and high level staff led, but the council's there to guide and to set policy yes. and, and things like that. How has it been though to be, to be really someone who's looked at as a leader in the city um, to be hit with this um, so early on when, when this council has also been very active in, in uh, making a lot of policy changes um, early on in your tenure? Yeah, I mean, nobody you know, expected this when we were running for office. I, I certainly didn't. And um, so it's been a unique challenge. Mm -hmm. I can certainly <laughs> say that. Um, in a way, you know, we took a lot of action very quickly when we got into office to sort of put into place some policy changes that most of us ran on, campaigned on. And so, so work was put into place and then, and then this pandemic occurred. So right now our primary focus is getting through this pandemic, um, keeping the community safe and, you know, then resuming the work that we started. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't know, it's been, it's been challenging yeah. and unique. <laughs> what is, and, and again, speak to what you can, but w w if, if someone's curious today and yeah. it's still safe to, to be out and about, safe to be in the backyard, yeah. safe to be out, what, what city services uh, are still accessible and what should, what should people just need to stay away from at this time? Is, can you give me an idea? From what I understand, um, you know, solid waste services is continuing, mm -hmm. so that would be your trash and recycling, our transit uh, transportation system or transit is uh, still running. It's running on a Sunday schedule, so mm -hmm. that just adjusts some frequency and some um, other routes are shifted, but it's still the normal Sunday schedule. So any you know regular rider who rides any day during the week, that's just the schedule that they would expect on a Sunday. Sure. Um, there's no fares, it's fare free. I saw that, that's a big deal, yeah. Yeah, and it's rear door boarding. Okay. Um, so those I think are some big city services that most people interact with on a daily basis that have that are continuing. Yeah, making the, 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 the bus, the, the transit services are so, that's been, a, I know, a, a topic of a lot of discussion with city council and with people who are involved yeah. in city politics and just making that as accessible as it can be during the time where we're allowed to, to again, get on the bus, go to yeah. work if you have to, it's so important. Yeah, and you know, there are a lot of folks who are dependent upon public transit to get to their necessary services, to right. get to their doctors, to get to their grocery store, pharmacy, to get to their job, yeah. the pharmacy. So we need to make sure that we're doing everything to, we can to protect our most vulnerable residents. And so I, that's sort of the lens I use when I, when I make decisions. Um, the transit you know, uh, change was you know, staff driven when we were certainly appreciative of mm -hmm. that. You don't, uh, just to go back a little bit, and uh, I'm gonna have some Raleigh Coffee Company <laughs> coffee. Uh, we're trying to do a, a, just a very small thing that we can just to give a nod to local organizations, local businesses. Uh, we've had beer on the last couple of episodes, so don't want to send the wrong message that all we do is sit in the backyard and drink beer. So having coffee today from uh, Raleigh Coffee Company. You don't strike me as a typical politician. Uh, you're not Bill Clinton pay, playing the saxophone on Arsenio Hall. Uh, right. Why did you get involved? Why did you get involved? Yeah, funny story. I actually uh, played the alto saxophone in elementary school because I was a big uh, Bill Clinton fan. Did you bring it? Um, Could you I play it now? I haven't played since middle school. Okay. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I don't think of myself as a politician. Yeah. Um, we touched on this a second ago, but the way the city of Raleigh is structured is the um, city council is like the board of directors, with the mayor being the board chair, and then the city manager is like the CEO and you know, the assistant managers, the officers, and, you know, staff runs the city. And I have done a lot of nonprofit work, and mm -hmm. the city is set up like a nonprofit. And so I felt very comfortable in that dynamic. And I've always been the type of person that if you see um, a void, then you, you rise to address. You don't wait for somebody else, if not me. What was that void for you? I d didn't like the direction I saw the city going in the past couple of years. I thought that we needed to be... Um, more open to new ideas and new people and change. 
And if we're going to be the city of progress and innovation, we need to start leading on a local level. And I also didn't think that the makeup of the council looked a lot like the fabric of the city. Mm. Um, I think we needed some younger folks, some, you know, diversity. Um, and so, you know, as a young gay man, yeah. um, never having had an out gay elected official in the city of Raleigh, I felt like that I could bring that perspective. And I also, like I said, I, I felt a void and I knew I could address it or I felt that I could address it. And so I decided to try. What was it? Because that was a really interesting, I thought, election because it w municipal elections, unfortunately, typically don't get a lot of pub. Yeah. Uh, uh, they don't get a lot of people to come out and vote. It's like historically, usually really low turnout. This was the opposite, where there were a lot of people either online or on Twitter or, or just following the elections. And then a lot of people actually did come out and vote, which, which probably was a help to you. Tell me about the process of just campaigning yeah. for, for likely the first time in, in, a, in a race like this. And then what did it feel like to, to, to on election night, kind of get, get ushered in? Yeah. So, I mean, a couple things, you know, turnout is still low. What I think what we saw with the last election, though, was that there seems to be a lot of um, new voters that came out. Right. Um, I think we still have a lot of work to do to increase the overall percentage of voters who are participating in municipal elections. But I liked the fact that we seemed to engage some new folks. Mm -hmm. um, running was crazy, for <laughs> lack of a better word. I didn't know what I was really getting myself into. I feel like I was a much better candidate towards the end. Um, than the beginning because I got really good help. Um, I hired a campaign manager. Um, she had been involved in you know the local scene for a while um, and with the county Democratic Party. And she really just helped prop me up and bring out the best qualities in me, which was uh, fantastic. It was challenging at times because people have very strong ideas and opinions, which is a great thing but sometimes um, can be challenging because, you know, you can't, you want to help everyone, but you can't. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you may just disagree with someone. And I've always been the type of person that it, maybe it's because I'm, you know, a divorce and family law attorney. <laughs> I really believe that reasonable, logical people can disagree on issues and that doesn't make either person a bad person. Um, and there are times no, you don't so hear that a whole lot these days. Do right. You? Well, th but there are times though, when you run up against someone who maybe has a different idea than you do and you know, they kind of treat you in a way that makes you feel like you're a bad person. And yeah. I, I really tried hard in my campaign to treat everyone with respect and with an open mind, mm -hmm. even my fellow you know, candidates. Election night was awesome. Um, you know, during the day we were at the polls all day. It was cold and rainy that day. I remember, yeah. Um, it's just a day I'll never forget. I think there are like certain like certain transformative times in your life. Like when I remember when I sat for the bar and took the bar exam. That was one of them. This will certainly be one of them. Um, the I ran at large, so the at large race. It's the top two vote getters, but you have to clear the twenty five percent threshold. Right. And I got twenty three percent. Yeah. So election night, I finished in one of the top two spots by not, but not by enough to avoid a runoff. Mm -hmm. So then the next couple of days was this. Is it going to be a runoff? Is there going to be a runoff? Yeah. Get ready for another campaign. Should there be a runoff? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So election night was extremely exciting, just <laughs> yeah. finishing in one of those top two spots. and um, But I didn't quite have the ushered in joy that someone who, who won without the possibility of runoff may have had. But that came um, a couple of days later, and mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. How did that happen? How, wh wh when, how did you get the news that there would not be a runoff? And tell me about, about that experience. Right. Well, first I want to say, um, the I, R Russ Stevenson is mm -hmm. who could have called for runoff, and he was a long-term- Long-term council member. Incumbent. Yeah. And he was extremely kind to me throughout the entire campaign. Mm -hmm. um, we actually you know, shared a lot of ideas. and. I was on my way to New York to visit my partner. I had gotten some advice that if there's going to be a runoff, just get your mind off of it, get out of town for the weekend. So I'm waiting in line to, you know, hand them my phone to scan my boarding pass. And I look down and it says Russ Stevenson. So I step out of line and I answer it and it was Russ and he conceded he was extremely kind. Um, and then I immediately called my campaign manager and I don't remember what we talked about. It was like 30 seconds long, but I looked up and everyone who was in the area around me was staring at me. And then someone was like, was that Russ? And I was like, huh? And he was like, was that Russ? <laughs> I was like, yeah. Like, did he concede? I said, yes. And then it was like this weird, like chain of congratulations. Someone. Whoa, that's um, yeah. In the airport, just, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, then absolutely. someone on my flight um, 
I guess, recognized me from the campaign. She took my picture and she posted it on her Facebook oh, before man. I even <laughs> um, put a post out. And so I was getting all these congratulation like texts and stuff. Yeah. So it was yeah, just a little this mini surreal, paparazzi following like, you around there. Yeah. It was like one of those movie moments. Yeah. And I remember thinking, you know, the election was Tuesday, Russ conceded on Friday. And every day in between then, you try to stay positive, but it's just this unknown. And I was kind of getting a little down on myself. And I remember thinking at that time, the way it all happened in the airport, right when I'm about to take off for New York, then I landed in New York, I had all these texts and phone calls, I got to spend the weekend with my partner and mm -hmm. celebrate. The, it happened at the exact perfect time. Yeah. And it was a really good lesson for me that, you know, things happen when they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And if it had happened any earlier in the week, I just don't think it would have been as special and memorable. That's such a cool story. Yeah. I, 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 I read, I think I read you tweeting about the, the experience in the airport, but I had no idea that there were actually people around and, and were like, what was that? Was that Russ? That, that kind of thing. I mean, yeah. that's, that's kind of odd for a council race. Don't it you think? was odd, <laughs> you know, because I was in line. So I yeah. was just in the middle of people and I had to step out, which I think was weird to see someone about to hand their phone and step out. And then I had my ear pods on. So I'm talking kind of like yeah. we're talking and I, I really just blanked. And I don't even remember what I said to my campaign manager. But I just remember when I looked up, people were looking at me. <laughs> and so suddenly I was like, maybe I should have, <laughs> maybe I should have taken this call. I should drive that. <laughs> right? That's, that, that's, that's super cool. Uh, I know it's really early on into, uh, into your, into your, to your term, uh, and 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 it, probably part of it feels like you'll be running again if if that's the plan for you to run again in the future. When when we met about this uh, and you were talking to me about why you wanted to 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 run for council, you listened a lot, which I really appreciated. And I would imagine that's what you did in a lot of your meetings with with voters and with people that were in business owners or leaders in the community, things like that. Uh, what were some of the things that you heard? during those listening tours, if you will, at a coffee shop or, or wherever that really resonated with you and that you're trying to implement? I know, like you said, you can't, you can't do everything that everybody wants, yeah. but what were some of the big things? Well, thank you. One thing about listening is I feel like I did a lot of it during the campaign. I do much more of it now. Hmm. Um, I tell folks now, I will meet you anywhere, any place, and I will listen. I can't promise you anything. Um, certainly, if I can help, I will try to help but I can promise you I will listen, that your, that your concerns will be heard and that I will try to elevate them in the best way possible. And I do a ton of that now. Um, I'm surprised how much of my job on council is just letting people you know, ex express concerns to me. Well, you're a planner, so how much of your day, how much on an average Jonathan day, how much of it is, is that, is listening, is sitting down with, with the constituent and, and listening? So I try to compartmentalize my time. Mm -hmm. So there are certain days that I say I'm just going to address to the business of the city to council work. And then mm -hmm. there are certain days that I try very hard just to work in my law practice. Um, but so I, I don't really know how to quantify it. Um, weekends and Tuesdays and Thursdays, I try to really um, focus on meeting people, community meetings, you know, council work. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it's like having to full-time jobs. <laughs> yeah. Are um, you ever off? Uh, I try to give myself some downtime, mm -hmm. um, but I really like being busy and I like the work. Um, so, and you know, I signed up for it. I didn't just sign up for it. I signed up for it, asked people to give me their money and right. went crisscross the city begging for people <laughs> to put me in the job. So, um, yeah, you kind of, you, you kind of, uh, you jumped in with both feet. Now you kind of, you, yeah, you got to live I'm up to it. it. Yeah. But you know, during the campaign, uh, a lot of folks I talked to I think that they felt uh, some similar frustrations that um, working with the city should be easier, doing business with the city, um, that we should be welcoming the fact that so many people want to move here, that mm -hmm. so many companies want to invest here. It's a good problem to have. It's a good problem to have that so many people love this city. They want to come here. They want to build. They want to invest. And they want to grow. Oh, totally. And yeah. It's important to do it in a way that is equitable and that we're making sure we're uplifting even our most vulnerable residents. Mm -hmm. But I am certain that the correct solution is not to just put a lid on the pot. Yeah. And I felt like a lot of that was happening in the past couple of years. And so that's most of what I heard during the campaign. Let's, let's embrace the fact that we're rapidly growing and let's, let's reach to our full potential. Yeah, it's a common sense kind of thing almost if you think about it. I mean, there's, there's, there's something to be said for controlled growth and affordable housing and all the components they need to make a, a city work well together. But to your point, I mean, people ask me the same thing. Why do you work all the time? Because I'm in a really good spot where it's good to work in my yeah. business. It's, it's we're in a place where people are moving. They got to move here for jobs. They got to move here for uh, education or they stay here after they're done with their education. And they, they, they like the quality of life that yeah. we have here in the city that we're in. Um, so 
yeah, it, it's, it's a good problem to have. And, and, and I think the city being more receptive to welcoming and opening arms to that growth is just, it just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, where you, what, what's, should, will I turn on the TV or, or look at your Twitter feed in a, in a year and see Jonathan Melton's running for Congress. Jonathan Melton is running for something else. Or are you, or, or are, are you happy where you are? Have you had at any time to think about that? I think I have learned through experience that you never say never, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I could not have guessed. That you can make path. some news on this show right now if yeah. you like. I did not <laughs> run for city council to leapfrog up to something else. Yeah. I felt like I said I had done a lot of nonprofit work and the city is structured like a nonprofit. Exactly. And I felt I had a, a skill set that could be useful and I felt a void that I felt I could address. So if there were another opportunity where I felt I had a useful set of skills and there was a void I could address, I would certainly hope that I would have the courage to rise to that occasion. Mm -hmm. Do I have a plan to do that? No. Um, I'm very happy um, in the role I'm in right now and I'm extremely happy with my law practice um, and with my personal relationships. Mm -hmm. But like I said, uh, I've always been the kind of person, if not me, then who? Mm -hmm. So wherever that takes me, it takes me. Mm. That's a very good lawyered up political <laughs> political answer i think that it is it's very it was appropriate it was it, it was i'm gonna leave that it's like that that coach who's had a really good year but he's only in his first year with the school and and you know right. he gets a call from uh it's basketball <laughs> and he gets a call from uh duke and they say we're you know coach k's out of here would you i'll, I'll no i'm you happy wish. i'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy where I am, but I would. But I think the way you put it is, pr is appropriate. You would. You always have to be open to other opportunities or ways to to serve. Well, I'm gonna tell you one thing. I know for certain. I know that I do not want to occupy this space um, for a prolonged period of time. Mm. I think what was really impactful for me in the witnessing the last election was so many new individuals um, running and earning their seat, or folks who were just serving their first term getting a second term. Yeah. Um, you know, I ran because I wanted to open the door for opportunity and I want to pull someone in behind me. Mm. So I don't plan to sit here for multiple terms um, just because, you know, I like doing the business of the city. I do like the business of the city, but I also want to provide opportunity for others. And I think when my time to move on comes, I will work really hard to make sure that somebody else who's eager and has a good skill set and feels a void is ready to, to, to step up. Should we have term limits for people on city so. council? Yes. What should those be? Have you thought about the, what the length of that should be? You know, I, I have ideas and I've talked about them before, but then, you know, when I bounce ideas off other people, I, I, I get good feedback and new ideas. M my inclination would be, I think, you know, four year stagger terms with two term limits mm -hmm. um, and then trying to move our elections to a period of time where they could get some more attention. But then, you know, I've heard I've heard good arguments why we shouldn't do it that way. Mm. Um, you know, four terms is a long time for someone in a municipal seat and, and um, you know, not having our elections during regular election years, we're a nonpartisan race. If you put mm. them during a regular election year, they could become extremely partisan. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I I do think there should be term limits. Um, the council actually authorized a, a task force or a study group to look at best practices for council term and how to increase voter engagement. So mm. I'm r really excited to see, they're gonna work with the city attorney's office. I'm excited to see what ideas they come back with and what structural changes we could implement for the next election. It's a good point. I think that the term limit thing, I've thought about it both ways. It, it, to your point, continuing to, to bring in new voices, new leadership, new people who want to be involved is, is awesome. And we saw that in the last election where some people who really, who, who felt passionately uh, about, about chipping in and being involved were, were in. Uh, they, they got in. The, the flip side of that is how deep is that bench, right? So how many people are back there who are who maybe they're currently serving on a planning board or another committee um, that are trying to, to, to be engaged. Have you seen that? Do you think there's a, a good, a good uh, a number of folks who are ready to step up if in, if in a term or two you're ready to, to step aside? Absolutely, and I think a lot of them don't even realize it. Hmm. I think for a lot of people running for office, it's a privilege to be able to run for office. Sure. A lot of people don't think they'll ever, ever be able to do it. And I think under certain current constraints, you're not able to do it. It is a part-time job. It, it doesn't pay to, to keep a roof over your head <laughs> or you know your, your lights on. And so there are a lot of people who would be great to serve. And there are a lot, there's a lot of demographics that we don't have on council and that the council has never had. Yeah. Um, but I think there are barriers in place. And what I would like to do during my time um, 
has continued to advocate and work towards eliminating barriers so that we can get different, more diverse, unique individuals serving on council. I mean, I would love for there to be term limits and as turn, terms turn over, we get new ideas, new perspectives, and people who would be great in the role may not even realize that they could do it, but then have the opportunity to do it. That's, that's well said. Uh, you mentioned that the council kind of runs like a nonprofit. Uh, we're trying to raise awareness to some nonprofits and local organizations on this little show. Uh, today, and I think I dropped my, I got it, mic pack. Uh, today, we uh, are raising awareness about an organization that we sponsor at Chapel Residential, the Green, Pro, uh, Green Chair Project. Uh, they were nice enough to drop off a hat and a shirt and a magnet, uh, and they do some really awesome work, mostly around Wake County, but around the area where uh, low-income families who need and, and really deserve really uh, quality home furnishings are able to get those at, at little or no cost. Uh, and it's just, I mean, if you've ever been by their uh, place on Capitol Boulevard, you need to check it out. It's really awesome. They have a great organization that does a lot of great work there. Wanted to, to raise awareness to the Green Chair Project. I asked them to give us a shirt so I could wear it on the show. <laughs> Uh, and, and they said, what size? And we said, well, we need a large. Um, they sent a woman's large, uh, so <laughs> couldn't quite squeeze into that. I'm trying to eat healthy and all that stuff, but I'm not there yet. Um, so we'll keep working on, uh, working on that. I'm gonna get some hand sanitizer, but uh, the Green Chair Project, uh, please check them out and, uh, and be involved if you can. Um, I don't wanna spend the whole time talking about city council. I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about personal as well. Tell us a little bit about uh, where you're from, uh, why you're here, what you love about this place, and, uh, and just about, again, you know, knowing the times we're in, um, how's your day-to-day -day going? I was born up north. Uh, my parents both worked in Manhattan mm -hmm. um, in the financial industry, and then we moved to Charlotte when I was in middle school, outside mm -hmm. Charlotte. I say Charlotte because that's where people know. We moved to Mooresville, not Morrisville, oh, like yeah. down the street. Is that where you're from? Yeah. I'm from Mint Hill. Okay, yeah. Um, so I know know that area very well so yeah welcome man oh uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I moved to Raleigh in 2004 to go to NC State mm -hmm. did four years at NC State and then I went down the street to Durham to go to law school at NC Central mm -hmm. and then I came back to Raleigh and started my professional life um, why this area I can't explain it it's just something about Raleigh you really feel like you are a part of something special and, you know, I talk to my partner about this a lot, and this is no disrespect to Manhattan, but I feel like Manhattan is what it's going to be. Mm. And in Raleigh right now, we're at this, I think, moment of shift and turn where we are growing to become what we will be. I think Raleigh is already obviously a great city with the great industries, but we are one of those, I think, emerging places right now. And I think you're right. Compared yeah. to like Austin and... We're nowhere near the ceiling. Uh, we're, we're, right. we're, we're in that direction. That's I get that question a lot from, from potential developer clients. Right. Like we're working with some new clients who are gonna build condos here and they're from DC or they're from New York and they're from uh, Charlotte. Uh, and, and I'm always like, why? why what, what made you, you know, choose to come here? Uh, because they usually call us out of the blue or whatever and come down for a visit. And they're like, we read everything about Raleigh, but we also realize that uh, Raleigh's got a lot of room uh, for growth. They need housing. People are moving there for a reason, uh, and it's and it's just a it has a good feel to it and a good environment for 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 that type of business. Yeah, I remember being in college, and it was a right around the time um, Charles Meeker was um, mayor, mm -hmm. and the city was really downtown was really starting to wake up. And um, I remember being on Fayetteville Street, I think in 2006, 2007, when they did the. Raleigh wide open or Fayetteville wide open when they had reopened Fayetteville yeah. Street and done yeah. those improvements. They built the convention center. And I remember having this feeling when I was in college that this, this place is really um, changing. <laughs> and that energy, that optimism, that positivity and forward thinking and welcoming growth, that is the energy I started to feel slip away the last couple of years mm -hmm. that I wanted to harness again and what caused me to run. So it's interesting now just having this conversation about why I chose Raleigh and you know my experience that I'm remembering that you know back in college I think a, a lot of the reason I decided to plant roots here is a lot of the reason I decided to run for office. Say so, yeah that's a, a real dovetail there part of yeah. the reason you wanted to be in Raleigh part of the reason you also chose to to, to take a to take a run at council. Yeah. That's really, yeah. Uh, you, you see yourself being here long term? Oh absolutely I mean I have a law practice here mm -hmm. um, I own a house yeah um, obviously I ran 
for office. Right. You kind of you got roots I, here. I, I wouldn't run to to be a council <laughs> member for a city I don't plan to. To move away in a couple <laughs> of years, that wouldn't look too good in the in the history books. Yeah. Jonathan was a a four term city council member <laughs> and then moved to Manhattan. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and cashed in and got his own reality show or, or whatever. Whatever they do. Yeah. <laughs> Talk a little bit about your the nonprofit you've been involved with as well. Uh, we've helped out a little bit here recently, but um, that has to be a little bit on the horizon. That's a, a summertime event, right? And uh, and has any thought been given? Tell me about what it is first, yeah. how it helps out, uh, and, and then have you thought about uncertainty with this summer coming up? Yeah, so it's Stonewall Sports. Mm -hmm. um, I co-founded the Raleigh chapter, and I was also a founding board member for the national organization. I do not run it on a daily basis anymore. Mm -hmm. I stepped down from Raleigh leadership many years ago now. Come on, man. You got plenty of free time. Right. Don't you, can't and, you? Uh, <laughs> well, it was one of those things also that I felt like I had given it everything I could, and I wanted to see what someone else could do. And mm -hmm. I just knew it was my time to step aside. And I think it's really nice to see something that you put so much time and energy and grow and exist without you and sort of change. And I still participate. And I help when they ask for help. And then with the national stuff too, I really shifted my focus to grow our recruitment and expansion to other cities. And then I stepped down from that as well, um, just a couple of years ago. But it's an LGBT and allied sports league mm -hmm. with a focus on philanthropy. So we promote and host you know, amateur sports, but then there's also a strong focus on raising money for nonprofits and for good work in the community. Mm -hmm. We're in I, I know I'll get this wrong. I think 20 or more cities at this point. Yeah. It started yeah. in D.C. My friends started a kickball league there. Sort of the same thing that caused me to run for office here. And I'm sorry I keep tying it back. But I'm like, we're having this moment. You're where learning so much I'm about like, yourself. I am. Uh, this um, is like a really high level counseling session. I would go, uh, there we go. I would go to D.C. and see all the good work they were doing on and off the field and the community they were creating. And I'd come back to Raleigh and think, well, there's no reason we can't have one of these. So yeah. I, you know, told my friends in D.C., hey, I think I want to do it here, too. We co-branded, and they had their D.C. League. We had our Raleigh League. And then people from other cities started to contact us and say, we'd like one of these leagues, too. And that's when we were like, wow, okay, I guess we're going to create a national organization. So it just evolved. Mm -hmm. But um, the tournament, we, ha we host a national tournament educational summit every summer. Last year it was in Raleigh, which was really nice. This summer, um, the tournament's supposed to be in Cleveland. It's supposed to happen in July, which is around the normal time. I don't know what they're planning to do. Mm -hmm. um, registration was supposed to open soon, but that's been postponed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think everybody is sort of waiting to see what happens. Uh, I'm confident we will emerge from this pandemic soon, I hope. I know, uh, we, I'm confident we'll emer emerge strong. Strong, yeah. It's a strong community, <laughs> all of us. But what that does for events that are already planned, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but like like I said, the the tournament educational summer summit is annual. It builds a strong sense of community. It does support you know local businesses and nonprofits. So I'm hopeful that they will be able to host it this year. And if not, then I guess it'll be twice as strong next year. <laughs> exactly. If they have to move. It. It's just like the housing market. People ask me every yeah. day, well, are people still buying houses? Well, sure, people are still buying houses. Is it as many people as there were yeah. three weeks ago? No. Um, but is there going to be, I think, a huge demand for houses again uh, once things get a little bit more back to normal? Yeah. Absolutely. It, to your earlier point, the reason you moved here, the reason you ran for council here, the reason you've organized here is because we're in a really good place. And so that's not necessarily going to change. It might just shift a little bit down the road. Yeah, I, I think so. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I mean, thank you for um, asking me to come talk and um, and for plugging you know, a local nonprofit. I know that there are several groups that are trying to really support our community right yeah. now. Um, the Interfaith Food Shuttle, mm -hmm. the uh, Food Bank of Eastern North Carolina, Raleigh Rescue Mission. Um, I know there are a bunch of groups organizing right now to support our hospitality industry. Restaurant specifically, groups. Like, yeah. Yes, restaurant and bars, um, small business owners. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need to all take care of each other including if you have the means, you know, supporting groups that are trying to lift up others. And um, we're going to get through it. I, I think we will. And I think to your point, we're going to get through it eventually and we're all going to be stronger. But at this time, anything that you can do out there, yeah. whether it's buying a gift card for a local restaurant or a donation to the food bank or whatever you can do, um, uh, just dig in a little bit more if, you, if you're able to. I think it really, that dollar stretches a little bit further today than it did, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. City council member, attorney, all around good guy, Jonathan Melton, uh, thank you. 
please stay tuned. We'll have another one of these really soon, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Have a great day. So thanks again for watching this episode of Chapel Chats. Please don't forget to uh, hit us up if you have an idea, if you'd like to be a guest. What else? Comment, share. Comment, share. Like, comment, like, share. Like, comment, subscribe. share, subscribe on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, MySpace. Are we on MySpace? This is going to take off. Tom still wants to be your friend. MySpace and Craigslist is going from there. Let's try it. <laughs> All right, thanks.